By the way, yeah, we have some fun in the Masters Riders group. I want to tell you about John Dufresne. He lives in Miami. He's married to the wonderful Cindy. They're seated up here on the second row. John is a professor of the MFA program at Florida International University where he's part of the creative writing program. He has degrees from Worcester State College and the University of Arkansas. In 2012, he was a winner of the John Simon Guggenheim Memorial Foundation Fellowship. He has novels that include Louisiana Power and Light, Love Warps the Mind a Little, both named the New York Times Notable Novels of the Year. Also included in his novels are Deep in the Shade of Paradise, Requiem, comma, mass. No regrets, Coyote. I don't like where this is going. Short story collections including The Way Water Enters Stone, Johnny Too Bad. He's written plays and screenplays. And most importantly, and in conjunction with the Somos mission statement, he supports and nurtures the literary arts, both written and spoken, because he's written three books on writing and creativity, A Lie That Tells the Truth, A Guide to Writing Fiction, A Guide to Writing Your First Novel in Six Months, and Lately, Flash, Writing the Very Short Story. Now many people know, but John has for two decades plus hosted Friday Night Writers an open forum for people aspiring to write, wishing to enhance their skills, wishing to explore whether they might be a writer. John does that all comers, Friday Night Writers. My pleasure to introduce John DeFray. Uh, thanks to Peggy and Peter for hosting this event. For us, for, it's like coming back to your family. It's like a reunion every year. It's uh, wonderful to be here again in, in this beautiful city. With this, um, we're from Miami. With this great weather, <laughs> this cold weather, and all that stuff. And so, yeah, Flash is the latest book that I wrote. Um, and uh, I'm going to read a few pieces of Flash fiction tonight. Also, I wanted to mention that David Norman, who's sitting in the third row, has a story in this a book as well. And I have a couple, uh, but I'm going to read one that's not in there to start with. But it, it actually um, came from uh, teaching here at, uh, in Taos. And, and every year I try to like make up a story and try to, this is the process of how I write a story. And one year I did one about Grady and Alice Bell. Uh, whose daughter was addicted and blah 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 and I, I just played it off and then I wrote it after I did it and like in class I said I should write that story and so it's called Dirt. Grady and Alice Bell's 20 year old daughter Hope has died. They're home alone after the funeral and the burial and after the distressing but obligatory reception for family and friends here at the house. Alice is slumped in a corner of the sofa I, I meant to put on my timer so I won't go over this. I thought, yeah, here we go. Uh, uh, Alice is slept in, in the corner of the sofa, a sweater draped, draped over her shoulders. She's blotting her swollen eyes with tissues and holding a porcelain teacup in her hand. Grady sits in a ladder back chair, elbows on his knees, spearing at his left hand, in which he grips a fistful of dirt. He's taken from Hope's grave. He believes that if he had been listened to, Hope would still be alive. People are like dirt, he remembers his Uncle Elwood saying. They can nourish you and help you grow, or they can stunt your growth and hasten your death. He wraps the dirt in his handkerchief and slips the dirt into his pants pocket. Grady's black silk tie is stuffed into the breast pocket of his suit jacket. He has a milagro, a religious folk charm used for healing purposes, and the shape of an eye pinned to his lapel. Grady has glaucoma. 
he brought the milagro in a tin of sacred dirt for a woman outside the Santuario de Chimayo in New Mexico. Rub the dirt on your eyes before you sleep, the woman told him. When he told her he also wanted a milagro in a tin of dirt for his daughter, the woman said, what's wrong with her? He said, what isn't? Alice's black hair is cut in bangs, streaked with gray, and held off her face with turquoise barrettes. When the sweater slips off her shoulder, Grady sees the tattoo of a flaming heart on her right arm. On the coffee table, there's an emblem of their loss, a photo of baby Hope sitting on a beach blanket, blue floppy hat on her head, and zinc oxide on her nose. Beyond Alice, Grady sees the staircase that leads to Hope's bedroom. He'll get up there, he thinks, before long to see what clues to Hope's secret life he might uncover. Hope was a drug addict who'd robbed her parents blind, gone in and out of detox, rehab, and urgent care facilities, and died of a heroin overdose, alone in a vacant lot. Grady sees a thread of gold under the coffee table and picks it up. It's a necklace, the one he'd given Hope on her 16th birthday. How did, it, how did it find its way here and when? Alice rests her teacup on a copy of Food and Wine. Shadow their sleek and disorderly black cat chews on the petals of the potted Easter lilies on the windowsill. Grady pictures Hope at 15, brunette braid over her shoulder, Hollywood smile, and hands on her hips like she's ready to astound the world. He stifles a sob and reminds Alice that he'd been against throwing Hope out of the house after her last relapse. You wanted her to hit bottom, he says, and she did. Alice feels like she's been clubbed in the face. She smashes the teacup on the tile floor and calls Grady a monster. Shadow leaps from the windowsill and blasts off into the kitchen. Alice weeps until she can't catch her breath. Grady knows he should go to her, but he's frozen with anger and overcome with shame. Alice bolts through the door. Grady tries to stop her. She pushes him away, runs out to the driveway, and screams. The neighbors peek out their win open windows. After Alice leaves, drives to her sister's house, Grady climbs the stairs to Hope's room opens the door, turns on the light. Shadow follows him. They both lie down on Hope's disheveled bed. Shadow rubs her head against Grady's face. Grady tells Shadow that Hope is not coming home. Shadow purrs and curls into a fuzzy ball in the crook of Grady's arm, and they sleep. Grady dreams that he is standing, or is planted, ankle deep, in heavy clay and mulch and cannot free himself. His feet have put down roots. He wakes feeling ashamed. Grady calls sick and sick to work. He's a high school science teacher at St. Jude's. He arrives at Alice's sister's house and finds Alice out in the garden planting bulbs. Her fingers are buried in the damp soil. Grady knows that gardening can be a restoration of numbed senses and an exercise in optimism. He also knows that the dirt is full of death and full of life. After the funeral, Father Collins told him that nothing that dies is dead for long. Grady believes, however, that death abides or it is not death. Grady's here to apologize for his indefensible remark and to convince Alice to come home where she belongs. He needs her forgiveness. She tells Grady her home was with hope. Before he thinks, he says, you threw her up when she needed us most. Alice stabs her trowel into the flower bed and says, hope was never going to stop using as long as she had a safety net. The argument escalates. A week later, Alice agrees finally to meet Grady for lunch at the Boulevard Diner. She tells him he's rented an 
she tells him she's renting an apartment. He's incredulous. Shouldn't he have been consulted at least? He says, we need to talk about hope. She says, I don't. I won't. I can't. I never will. Not to you. Not to anyone. When Alice comes by to pick up her clothes and some furniture, Grady is helpful and understanding. He's going to take this opportunity to persuade her yet again to stay. She arrives with her pal Austin from the radio station where she works. So Grady never gets a moment with her despite his ineffectual wrangling. And the whole move is over in 20 minutes. That night, Grady's at his kitchen table pouring over photos in the family album, trying to discern the moment when his daughter decided to hell with ballet and tennis, I'm going to be a derelict. His heart is broken. His resolve is wearing thin. Maybe he should let Alice get on with her life, and he with his. No. He can't let despair stop him from trying to save their marriage. Love abides, he believes, or it isn't love. He calls Alice and leaves a message on the machine. Please, he says. Let's try marriage counseling. You owe us that. He wonders if she's listening to him as he speaks. He wonders if she's alone. In Hope's closet, Grady finds a pile of moleskin notebooks on the floor beneath a tangle of blouses. He carries them to the bed and sits. 42 notebooks, most with one or two entries. Grady imagines that each notebook must have symbolized the beginning of a new life for hope. Always starting something, always moving on. But each of her aborted attempts at redemption only emphasize how hard it is to leave the sickening past behind. The single entry in one notebook read, before you kick me out of the house, please talk to me like I'm a human being who does in fact have feelings for you. Stealing is shitty, lying is a strategy. If you don't want to talk to me, then my life might as well be over. Buried in the middle of an otherwise blank notebook, this, irregardless, a prose poem. 30 milligrams is usually enough. When Grady decides to put the gold necklace away, he finds the tank tarnished milagro of a praying woman and the unopened tin of sacred dirt in Hope's jewelry drawer. He mixes the dirt from her grave into the Chimayo dirt, buries the milagro in the dirt, and hides the tin in a bookshelf downstairs behind teaching high school science through inquiry and argumentation. At marriage counseling, Grady makes it clear he's here to save the marriage, but when Dr. Strout asks Alice what she wants, Alice says she wants a divorce a new life. She tells Grady she loves him but can no longer live with him. We need each other, he says. We suffer together. We'll heal together. Alice closes her eyes and weeps. When Grady holds her, she shrugs him off. Dr. Strauss tells Alice to stay there, to feel the anger, the rage, the pain, the injustice. Alice tells her to be quiet, please. Everyone in this office is helpless. Everything is broken. The session is a disaster that leaves Grady, Grady bereft. But then, before the session ends, Alice agrees to come back home. We'll see how it goes, she says. Dr. Strout does not ask why. Grady is victorious, but knows the struggle to save his marriage has just begin, begun. Alice sits on the sofa, reading by lamplight, but she's been on the same page for an hour. When Grady looks at her in the light, he sees a halo around her head, his glaucoma. St. Alice, he thinks. When he notices that the baby's photo is not on the coffee's table, he realizes Alice is holding the photo behind the book, punishing herself with the image of her loss. In that moment, Grady understands that time will heal some wounds and he'll eventually get over the loss of Alice. 
but he also understands that in one case, time will make no difference, and he will never recover from the shattering loss of his child. Coaxing Alice home has shown Grady the futility of their decision to live together, to continue their mutual journey, mired as they are in the muck of the past. The end. Well, I put this on and then it's gone away. I don't know uh, how long that took, but um, let's see. Um, well, here's this, you know, one of the things in flash fiction um, that makes writing flash fiction fun is that you borrow, um, you borrow from the world non-fiction uh, forms, like obituaries, that's one, right? You borrow an obituary and you turn it into a story. Or uh, an intake form from a welfare office, or blah, 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 whatever you want, you just do it. And so this is, this is actually, this one is actually in the book. Okay. In the book, so I write this little preamble in the book. Um, uh, time to write your. So here's the, here's the thing. When I was in high school, uh, I flunked algebra twice. Algebra one, algebra two. I got an A in geometry. In the middle of those, failed. I didn't get it. I, I don't think abstractly. I think that was the answer. If there was geometry, I could see the little triangle, and I knew what was there. And algebra was something else. And so, so, but when I was in Ellen, I did pretty good until long division. Um, and then, uh, so I went to, to Catholic elementary school. And then, when I was in the eighth grade, they introduced something that they called the new math, which turned out eventually to be a disaster. <coughs> and it was this. This is a wrong way to teach math, but. We were the experiment. We were going to do that. And so it was word problems. They started mixing numbers and words together. Words had been my friends. <laughs> and now they were, they, I had been betrayed. And I didn't know how to do any of this. It was, it was so sad because I thought, I was like, I'm, I think I'm the second smartest guy in this class. Until then, and I said, I'm not even close. Anyway. So what I did was the idea of a word problem. You might remember this. They say, you know, uh, you sold so many carrots at so much uh, a, a pound last year, and you made this much money. And this year, the carrot, you know, blah blah blah. And you do all this, and the, the train leaves the station, traveling X number of miles, with all this kind of all that. So that's it. So it was like take a word problem and write a short story about it. So I did, and it's called word problem. Of course. So here it goes. <laughs> The North Shore Limited pulls out of Westland Station at 7.25 a.m., heading for Eastland, 263 miles away, traveling at 67 miles an hour, which is not nearly fast enough for Trent X, <laughs> who is sitting in a dining car, sipping his tepid coffee, and staring at the appalling ugliness of the desolate prospect out his window. Every brown field and every dilapidated house a lacerating insult to his sensibility. He shuts his eyes and imagines Kathy's delight when he shows up at her condo today, unannounced, and asks her to marry him. At 8.13 a.m., Kathy, Y, leaves Eastland Station aboard the Lakeshore Zephyr headed for Westland, traveling at 61 miles per hour on a track parallel to the North Shore Limited's making one five-minute stop at mile 45 in Blisterville. She's distracting herself with a crime novel set in Las Vegas, but it's not working. She imagines how flabbergasted Trent will be when she arrives at his flat unannounced, uh, and how despondent he'll be when she calls off the romance. <laughs> Breaks his heart. <laughs> at Blisterville, Tony O.K. boards the train and takes a seat beside his new girlfriend, Kathy. They embrace and Tony O. tells her everything will be all right. He hopes he made the terms of their affair clear enough. He is who he is, after all. Can a leopard change his spots? At what time will the trains meet? And when they do, when the dozing Trent is slapped out of his dreamland by the concussion of colliding slipstreams, Will he look out the window and see a woman with her head resting against 
her own window, a woman who looks very much like Kathy, but can't be, and will Kathy feel the vibration of the train in her skull and in her teeth and visualize the coming unpleasantness with Trent and the ensuing redemptive bliss with Tonio? And since the two envisioned visitations will not, in fact, happen, can this relationship between Trent and Kathy be saved? Everything happens for a reason. Isn't that what they say? Show your work. Yeah, yeah, one more. Um, and that was like, you know, I could look in the back of the algebra book and get the answers. <laughs> and my problem was that, yeah, show your work. What are you talking about? I'd be on the bus going to school. You got your, you, did you do that work? Let me just see. Anyway. They were on to me and he would say, like, you do, friend, do problem number one. And I just go, I got no idea what you're talking about. Anyway. Um, this is called Mr. Big Shot. Bob has a wandering eye, not in the forbidden fruit sense, but in the less familiar and less hazardous strabismus sense. To conceal the offending abnormality from the distressed gazes of fragile strangers, Bob wears a, a tinted right lens on his eyeglasses, in his eyeglasses, yeah. Bob and his friend Otto occupy a corner table facing the entrance at the House of Wheat and Water restaurant in Normal, locally acclaimed for the Nouveau Prairie cuisine. Bob insisted boiling cabbage back in the kitchen, even though there is no cabbage of any kind listed on the menu. He knows so, he knows so from the corrosive smell of rotting fish heads wafting through the dining room, and from his irritated and watery left eye, the hydrogen sulfide, he explains. Otto sniffs the ear, acorns. The two friends are awaiting the arrival of a very important person who has something valuable that they hope to tell him, them. The nurse, uh, they nurse tumblers of thin lemonade and make small talk to allay their anxiety. Otto per peruses the menu and says, I see that chef is doing some fun things with parsnips. Bob says, why don't you take off the toque? Otto pulls the wool hat down on his eyebrows. It's my brand, he said. It's rude, Bob said. <coughs> People know me by the hat and the thumbs. Otto has hammer thumbs, foreshortened and thin at the base, with tips as small and fleshy as pearl onions. Otto catches Bob's eye and points with his chin to the table at Bob's right. You see that? He does not, of course. The diner, a gentleman in a tweed jacket, has covered his head with a large embroidered napkin, beneath which he is chomping, it sounds like, on crackling bone. Bob turns and sees a pair of uh, an esodactyl avian feet on the diner's white china plate. When the gentleman removes the napkin, he picks up the tiny russet bill out of his mouth and sets it beside the feet. He dabs grease from his glossy lips and sips his pink watermelon champagne. Otto points to the parchment menu, Ortolan Bunting. He reads, drowned in Armagnac. The fig and gorge bird is roasted and served piping hot on a bed of frise. When bitten into, the pea-sized lungs and heart burst with lemon-scented flour on the tongue. <laughs> the bell over the door rings and an undistinguished looking couple enter. He stomps his boot on the carpet. She pins her hair back with a fierce looking hair clip. False alarm, Barb says. Be still, my heart. Otto says, how will we recognize him? Otto says, uh, him, whom? The wheel, the neighbor, the VIP. He'll recognize us, he will. We have been chosen. Why us, why not? What will he tell us? or what we ask us. Whatever the question, our answer will be yes. The waiter, Baptiste, arrives with a crystal bowl in each hand. Bob says, we didn't order this. Baptiste says, compliments of Chef Andre. He sets the bowls on the table, steps back, bows from the waist, unfolds his hands and says, what we have for you gentlemen is potato, starch, and dirt soup. Laura says, 
Dirt is a metaphor, I take it. <laughs> dirt is a special black soil from the Eastern Prefecture. Is this on the menu? Yes, sir. Just below small place, under geophagy. Baptiste points to the item with his baby finger. Otto says, the sautéed sea bass. How is that prepared? With dirt risotto and verdict root. It's our most popular dish. Otto samples the soup, smacks his lip, and drops a spoon. Bob is skeptical. Bert? Otto says, we live in filthy times. <laughs> Baptiste tells him, we all need to eat more dirt to combat allergies and autoimmune diseases. We're not exposed to enough microorganisms that once covered all of our things. You're just saying that. I'll leave you gentlemen to your soup. We're expecting a third. So you said, just so you know. Otto says, I loved being dirty as a kid. It meant I had done something. It was like a badge of honor. I ate mud pops, me wallpaper pills, laundry starch. Are you gonna finish your soup? I am. I suppose our lives will be quite different from here on out. They say he always knows exactly what one needs. What do we need? Redemption. How is it we fell from grace? Baptiste returns. The important person you are waiting for cannot keep his appointment and has rescheduled for tomorrow at the same time. He sends his regrets. Isn't that the way with important people, Otto says. Tomorrow it is then, Bob says. We've waited this long, what's one more day? Otto says, you've told us this before, haven't you? As recently as yesterday, Baptiste says. Bob takes off his glasses, rubs his eyes, and says, is this some sort of game? Which one of us are you looking at, Baptiste says. You. I'm only a messenger. Bob says, perhaps we should go. We should go, Otto says. Bob puts on his glasses. Otto twiddles his little thumbs. Baptiste says, are we ready to order? Bob says, what would you suggest? Our special house uh, omelet made with creamy turkey eggs and sprinkled with a mealy loam from the White River Valley, which has a slight potash nose and a robust iron oxide finish. Sold, Otto says. Two, Bob says. That's it, thank you. Yeah.